All right, well, job well done, folks. Oishi, Akasaka. You guys have become the heroes of Takatsuto. <laughs> and to celebrate, and to not forget to do this at least once per per chapter. Let me see. Change art styles. Oh, <laughs> look at the uh, look at Oishi go in uh, the manga gamer sprites. But we're going to be going with uh, this for a little bit. This is your hero, Toshiki Inukai. Look at him. Look at him with his uh, glorious belly. Even more pronounced than this. This <laughs> Oishi smiled miserably. The fact that the Onigafuji guardians, or rather, the sons of the family behind them, was pulling the strings was apparent, but proving it wouldn't be easy. Yeah. More than likely it won't. It won't be easy. However, for the rest of the day, it's time for you to rest, Akasaka. Now, I want to remind you of something. You did mention that uh, last night they didn't call Yuki. I want you to go back to your apartment tonight. You're gonna call Yuki and you're gonna tell her how much you love her. A lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. And with apologies to Oishi, this incident was unlikely to go public. If this caused an uproar, it would obviously lead to the minister losing his office. With HQ having decided that doing so was in the national interest, this would probably be cleaned up quietly. It might be a rough way of saying it, but this was born in the shadows, and was going to die in the shadows. Oishi probably already understood the implications behind this incident. As the tension in this situation faded, the pain from the gunshot wound in my shoulder blossomed once again. Oh yeah, that's right. He got shot at that point. <laughs> you know, you guys have been working so hard as the new heroes of Takatsuto, trying your damnedest to fight the kidnappers. I had one job in this entire thing, and that is to make the right decision, and I blew it up. <laughs> if I were to retire from being a detective in the distant future and change my job yet again to maybe become a hero, maybe, I will be quite a bumbling hero. <laughs> my forehead was also stinging painfully, and I had grown hot enough to start a fire. Thinking that the tension had caused me to sweat, I wiped my forehead, but what came off was a large amount of blood. I realized that my shirt had been stained bright crimson from the blood flowing from my head. I turned around. The boy was safe and sound. Without a doubt, there would probably be an investigation on the man who ran. But that was for another day. At this point in time, I could safely say we had cleared the major hurdle of securing the boy's safety. As soon as I recognized that, it felt like the lights in my head had been hit by a power failure. Yeah, I guess so. My knees buckled from underneath me, the ground there feeling as soft as a cloud. It didn't feel unpleasant even as I was covered in the rain-soaked mud. Oishi came closer, asking if I was okay, but somehow I couldn't tell. I turned off the switch to the last light in my head. The exhaustion enveloped me. Sleep. Something softer than any blanket wrapped around me.
Only one tip for right now. A very kind person. Made a daring rescue. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I do mention all this about the heroes of Takatsu and all that. I mean, hey, the boy Inukai, he did uh, have thoughts of super uh, superheroes before this, so I say it fits. Patients admitted to the hospital can only accept calls at fixed times. That's why she wouldn't be receiving a call from him today. Yesterday, she had teased him that he got lonely easily. So he might have struggled with the idea of calling her sooner. That was much easier to imagine. But other than that, he might just be too busy to call. Because he's just that type of person. Yukie whispered that, smiled to herself. The announcement that visiting hours were overplayed over the hospital intercom, along with some music. She exchanged pleasantries with the family of the patient that was staying in the same room as her. Probably eager for his mother to be discharged, their small child was wearing a beaming smile. The child's mother was pregnant in the bed next to mine, but what may be their new brother or sister? They were probably ready to burst with the expectations, dreams, and ways of having a new sibling. The joys of a growing family. Babying in those warm feelings. I struggled my own baby, which I had grown quite large. I had talked with him about how many children we wanted to have. We talked about how if we had three, it would certainly be lively. However, there was the inescapable worry of whether I should be able to... If I would be able to handle giving birth that many times. Yukiem, smiling as she said to herself, gently stroked her stomach. The Metropolitan Public Safety Division. The place where that man's sense of justice had led him. That person was actually a very gentle, very fragile person. He didn't talk much about the specifics, but I didn't think he was suited for the assignment he was on right now. But, as long as he said he was going to try his best, I would watch over him warmly. <laughs> you know, you could say that this is going to be like a very interesting story to tell their child in the future. When uh, the child is going to grow up, they're going to ask about their father and their mother when they were given birth Akasaka is gonna tell that he was not there for the birth of their child or maybe he's still gonna get, like maybe he is gonna come back in time to see their child when the time will come Akasaka is gonna tell the stories of the heroes of Takatsu when uh, when the child is gonna ask when uh, where Asuka was at the time of his birth He's gonna say that he was there saving the world. <laughs> that would be cute. Yukiya seemed to be enjoying herself as she talked to her own baby. At that moment, Yukiya suddenly became concerned about something and looked out the window. It used to be this time, long ago. She remembered that when she was little, around this time in the countryside where her grandmother lived, Teigurashi would fill the air with their quarrels. Shh. Okay, maybe a little too early for me to say this or ask this, but did she live in Hinamazawa as well? This was the middle of Tokyo. Unlike in the countryside, you can't hear the song of Higurashi. But for some reason, at the moment, Yukiya felt that she wanted to hear that song. Interesting. Alright, well, let's see. Like, now that we um, saved Doshiki Inukai, I wonder how much of the chapter we have left. Because this is a short chapter. I don't know how many parts we have left, though. That was my first time losing consciousness. You often hear her regaining consciousness on top of a bed. But this was my first time actually experiencing it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
I was a little bit surprised there for a second. I forgot for a minute that we changed to the sprites. Hmm. You know, I was I was a little bit off put by uh, Iria's Kuryukishi sprite like last time. I get the feeling that now he looks a lot better with with a lab coat. Well, that's not that I was awake. A young doctor called out to me. I, I, I didn't intend to respond, but since my body language had told him I was conscious, my head was wrapped in bandages. The scratch all over my body had also been treated. My sense of pain also returned with my consciousness, causing me to groan from the intense pain shooting all throughout me. Oh my god, that's right. He also got hit in the head with a rock. God. I remember that this young doctor was the one in the car headed to the opposite way earlier. Yeah, of course. Dr. Irie left the room to go call Oishi. And the scenery outside the window was tinted with gold. The pouring rain had stopped, with the voices of the Higurashi heralding the cooling temperature. I felt that the tone of the Higurashi's voices was comforting. Eventually, I could hear heavy footsteps coming closer, which are reckoned to be Oishi's. The fog that was enveloping my head was slowly faded back to reality. What had happened since then? What had happened to the boy? What about the reinforcements from Tokyo? The door to the room flew open, allowing Dr. Iri and Oishi to enter. じゃあ命に別状はないんでしょう。ないとお約束はできません。頭に受けた傷は初見だけでは判断が危険なのです。わかりました。わかりました。ちょっと彼と二人で話がしたいんですが、よろしいですかね。ええ、どうぞ。何
I'm actually a little bit surprised that Xion actually talked about that in the first place. If this was supposed to be something secretive. And then again, it's Keiichi. I like a 14 year old boy. Like, what is he gonna do? Like, <laughs> with that information? Not much. So, like, you wouldn't talk about that sort of stuff to the police or anything like that. But Keiichi, eh. I guess there, were, there was no harm in mentioning the kidnapping to him, like in chapter 2. Other than that, eh. The possibility that the minister had negotiated with perpetrators couldn't be ruled out. But something like that was no longer my concern. You know, speaking of the kidnapping, I do remember the time when I was thinking that maybe the kidnapped boy was Satoshi. Oh, that was surely this disproven. We know that it's not Satoshi who, was got, who got kidnapped here. And my role in this case was over. <laughs> Oishi left boisterously. When we first met, I was somewhat prejudiced against Oishi. But now that feeling was gone completely. そうすれば黒幕のその先本気に少しは迫れるんですが。まあ、適当に迫ったところで圧力がかかるんでしょうがね。やれやれです。大石さんはその先本気に今後も戦いを。まさか。いろいろと黒い噂こそ絶えません
I can apparently breathe a sigh of relief when I heard those words. Now I get to spend time with Yukio. And be there for the birth of your child. Oishi-san <sighs> Oishi took out his wallet, casually pulled out several large bills, and jammed them into the breast pocket of my shirt. <laughs> sure thing. Oishi flashed me a grin. もしもあなたの傷が軽いようなら東京へ帰る前にぜひ声をかけてくださいよ。おい、さんも佐藤さんもぜひあなたともう一度宅を囲みたいと言ってましたからね。ああ、メン。やれやれ。ま、言ったな
I relaxed a bit now that things had progressed this far, but it was exactly as Oishi had said. When I realized that this was enemy territory, I suddenly felt uncomfortable. With living being the only thing left for me to do, the chance that I would come to harm was logically fairly low. But that didn't mean I was completely safe. So this ne. Yoko ni natte iru dake nara, hotel no bed to demo onaji na kiga shimasu. So desho, so desho. Watashi mo sono hou ga ii to omaimasu. At that moment, I caught a glimpse of the clock over Oishi's shoulder. It was the evening. The hours when I could call Yuki at hospital were almost over. I wanted to tell her as quickly as possible that I would soon be back at her side. Just, Yuki no bioin ni denwa shite kimasu. Lobby ni kousu denwa toka wa arimasen ka. Shinkon san wa soyu no mame da na. Tashi ka kaike no waki ni atta to omaimasu. Koko de matte masu kara itteroshi itteroshi. Oishi, laughing while saying that he was jealous, opened out the window and pulled out a cigarette even though he was in the hospital room. Appreciative at how considerate Oishi was, I set out to the lobby to find the phone. The lobby was just a short distance down the hallway from the hospital room. Alright, well, might as well just uh, change it to... Is it a console? Yeah, I think it's a console. At least I think so. I thought that this hospital was a bit too grand for a village like this. But of course, it was nothing compared to the general hospital Yuki was admitted to. Running inside a hospital wasn't the best of manners. But calling hours would soon end, so I dashed over in a hurry. There was nobody else in the lobby. It may have been the evening, but there was nobody at the reception desk. Well, this might actually be lucky for me. I wasn't planning to have a conversation to feel guilty about. But it would still be embarrassing to have someone listen to the conversation between me and Yuki. Taking a quick look around, I soon found the payphone. Actually, you know, now that I'm reminded of um, of the sprites, like I'm, I'm thinking this because recently I made like a, a tier list for pachinko sprites for <laughs> for uh, Mineko. And now it just occurred to me that maybe there's going to be like a similar situation to uh, to Higurashi as well. Like the Ryukishi sprites were lo are loved. The console sprites are obviously how we view uh, the characters. Whereas for the other sprites, they are less favored. I don't know. I guess we shall see. Digging out in my pockets, I grabbed a few coins. I was calling Tokyo from here. So I would burn through this amount fairly quickly. I picked up the receiver and inser inserted the coin, then dialed the number for the Yukiya's hospital, which I had completely memorized at this point. Actually, is it like that? No, they, why, why do I sound like it's a, a vibrating phone, like it's vibration? No, it's... I can roll my arrows. The number of for Yuki's hospital had a lot of eights and nines, so dialing it inevitably took some time. Normally, it wouldn't be a big deal, but currently, any time was precious. However, I felt that something was strange as I was dialing in the number. I don't know exactly how to put it, but it was as if the receiver was too quiet. The unique white noise from the telephone line wasn't there. Mm -hmm. Somehow, I felt that I wasn't getting any feedback from the phone. And without feeling a response, I hung up the receiver to try again. The coin popped out from the return slot. I reinserted the coin and began dialing once again. But the receiver was still dead silent. What? <laughs> Oh, fuck off. Fuck the fuck off. I better not uh, see like any bad, bad news here. When it comes to a new kind of kidnapping here. While I was waiting a time like this, 
the amount I had to spend talking with Yuki had shrunk. I began to feel needlessly impatient. I felt the presence of someone on the other side of the glass, so I called out. There was an immediate response, and a man who seemed like a pharmacist came over. The man came over and tried testing various things with a receiver pressed to his ear. Come to think of it, this was someone who worked at the hospital, not someone from the phone company. Just as I didn't know much about phones, neither would he. The man held up the cord that connected the phone to the wall. He was completely s severed. Oh, okay. I was thinking something much, much worse right now. I was thinking that there was a silence on the other end of the, on the other end of the phone, because Yuki was not there, and that she got kidnapped. Well, let's pray to God that that's not gonna happen. <laughs> God damn it. これじゃ電話会社の人に直してもらわないとどうにもならないですね。電話でしたら事務室のを使います。I didn't want the people in the hospital office around while I was talking. あ、近所に公衆電話はありませんか。えっと、ここ出て道なりに行くと商店街に出ます。そこのどこかの角のタバコ屋にあったような気がするな。I was dressed in a hospital gown. I was wearing sandals on my feet. My head was wrapped in bandages. Just looking at me, you could tell I was a hospital patient. No matter how you look at it, I was not dressed to be wandering outside. On second thought, maybe you should take that phone inside the office. Akasaka. I'm just saying. Like, I doubt that he's gonna die or anything like that, but because of maybe he's gonna fall into some trap or something like that, but nah. like, I don't see any reason why somebody would cut the phone here, but that's where the impetuousness of youth came in. Choosing the chance to talk to Yuki for even a little longer, I headed outside in my current state. Follow the road to the shopping district. Should be able to find one soon enough. With only those two lines as my guide, I ran outside the gates of the hospital. With the village nestled in the valley, when the sun set, it got dark quickly. The sparse streetlights lit up enough to start attracting mouths. The Higurashi, knowing the time for their chorus was soon at a close, redoubled their fragile cries. Finding the payphone wasn't as easy as the person at the hospital had suggested. Was it still up ahead? Did I miss it already? Was I just getting farther away? Just as I was about to be crushed by the wave of certainty towering over me, I found a shop in the corner with cigarettes written on a small sign. My joy spurred me onwards. Just as I had heard at the hospital, set next to the counter of the cigarette shop was an antiquated payphone. I wasn't wearing a watch, so I didn't know what time it was. I probably didn't have much left, though. But it was enough. Just as I could tell Yuki my job was done, and I would be coming home soon. Picking up the receiver, I sent the coin down the slot. But I felt that something was strange, just like at the hospital. Even after inserting a coin, the phone showed no response. <clears throat> I hung up the receiver and tried putting in the coin one more time. Are you kidding me? They cut the wire here as well? But there was absolutely no response. This phone was dead. It couldn't be. Thinking that, I felt along the cord that protruded from the back of the phone. Doing that, my hands found the end of a completely severed line. What the fuck? Like... Same here. Possibly the same in the office as well. Whoever it is, somebody doesn't want us to talk to 
like talk to Yuki like at all. They do not want us to make like any phone calls. I am thinking if Rika has anything to do with this. Like the idea is that she wanted us to go back to Tokyo. Well, now we are going back to Tokyo. But I wonder if us saving Toshiki Yunukai was something in her favor or not. Because, like, I'm, I am thinking that maybe it's Rika who put the wall there as well. Maybe Rika was the one who saved um, Toshiki as well. That because of this, now we're going to go back to Tokyo. So, in that sense... There shouldn't really be, like, any incentive for Rika to punish us at this point. Like, hey, we did our job. No, we, we truly promised that we're going to go back to Tokyo. Like, no matter what. So, I don't know. Is Rika going to be mad at us for this? Is she the one who's doing this? For what reason? What is this? Have you now had the same thing happen twice? My bafflement was accompanied by a sense of unease. It seemed that the cord had been severed cleanly by a sharp blade of some sort. And I may be mistaken, but it didn't look like much time had passed since it was cut. <laughs> Opening up the booth window of the tobacco shop, I looked for someone in the dim lit interior. Eventually, there were the sounds of somebody plodding down some stairs, and an old lady appeared. The old lady's plodding and lethargic steps, for some reason, only served to make me more frantic. Um, pray to God it's not the same woman as before, like the old lady with a weird voice. I don't want to hear that voice again. Okay, it's a different person. Okay, that's bad. Realizing that saying the phone was broken and asking them to take a look at it was going to get me nowhere. I swore back my words. Unless it's not just Rika, but the entire village is against us. <laughs> like, we saved... Inukai against the wishes of um, the village. Because now, like, the future is uncertain when it comes to uh, the damn protest. Because obviously, the damn protest is still going to happen. Like, they're still going to continue construction. But I wonder if it's going to be paused right now because of this, or it's going to continue. Because it kind of depends on how that, that, that is going to go. Like, if the dam protests, like, if the dam construction is going to get paused, the villagers shouldn't really have anything against us. But if the construction is still going to continue because of us saving Toshiki Inukai, yeah, the villagers would have a beef with Akasaka at this point. So it kind of depends on how things are going to go. And the worst part is that we're not even sure. Does Rika have a beef with us? Does the village have a beef with us? I don't know. Now, spooky stuff is gonna happen no matter what, that's for sure. The old lady directed me to another painful that seemed quite a ways away. Her way of telling me was so long-winded that I inevitably started to get impatient. At that moment, I spotted a clock in the dim interior of the stove. The minute hand was just about to point straight up. Even if there was a phone right here that I could use, I would only be able to tell Yuki a good night by the time I had left. On top of that, my destination was a remote payphone which I didn't know the exact distance to. If I was of a normal state of mind, Deciding to give up the phone today would have been the natural thought process. Yeah, you know what? Maybe you should go back home. Like, Yukia can wait for another day. <laughs> Without a call. 
let's, let's, let's just go back to the hospital and just mind our own businesses. But at that moment, I become somewhat stubborn for some reason. Ah, damn it. Unable to use the phone in the hospital and coming out here and still being unable to use one. There was no mistaking that I had become quite insistent on using a phone. Alright. Revisiting her offer to draw me a map, I left the tobacco shop. According to the old lady, even though the phone booth was quite far away, it would be easy to find. If I just followed this road straight down, I'd eventually find it. Send those flapping as I ran, I couldn't help but laugh at myself. I'll admit that I was quite set fast about calling Yuki, but there were days when I was tired or busy when I couldn't call her. Even today, my entire body was covered with injuries, and I was dead tired. On top of that, there wasn't much time left. Now, going back to the idea that Rika or the villagers have a beef with Akasaka, and they're cutting the phone lines so that he wouldn't be able to call Yukie. The villagers now know because Akasaka did mention the first day on his trip that, hey, my wife is giving birth soon. They learned that information from him. That was a slip up from Akasaka. So you could definitely say that this moment that is happening right now it's because of uh, Akasaka's uh, slip up. That if it didn't slip up, then this wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't be strange at all if today was one of those days I didn't call her. But having twice been foiled trying to call her, had I become hard headed about it? Was it like a dog who's being told to stay with a piece of food dangled in my face? <laughs> Even so. I somehow couldn't quell the uneasy feeling sitting in the pit of my stomach. It was like that with the hospital phone, and the same with the one in that tobacco shop. But of course were definitely not severed from being frayed by long years of use. The clean cuts indicated that someone had taken something sharp and deliberately cut them. But who? And for what reason? The more I thought about it, the more uneasy I felt. So I tried to push the thought aside. How much had I run so far? The scenery around me was no longer that of a shopping district, with residential buildings scattered about the lonely road. The surroundings had already grown dark. I was blatantly out too far for a quick phone call, and it was quite obvious I was far removed from the hospital. I recall the clock I saw at the tobacco shop. It might almost be time. I had run for quite a bit, so my breathing had grown quite ragged. If I had just wanted to hear Yuki's voice, I should have just thrown away my reservations and borrowed the phone in the office, and yeah, pretty much. I... I regretted it a little. Well then, was it about time to give up? Just when I thought that, I saw the light in front of me. I finally found it. It was a phone booth. Oh god, this place. <sighs> it seemed that the light in the phone booth had recently been changed, as it shone with a vivid white light. I'm saying this because this is like the CG background that is associated with like the police finding out about, about Tomitake's death, so it kind of reminded me of that. Although in the gloom of Hinamazo, it was nothing more than a gathering spot for moths. But in any case, I finally found it. As my hand touched the door of the phone booth, I realized that I was breathing and sweating heavily. I didn't know what time it was right now, but even if it was just for a moment, I might be able to get in touch with Yuki. Since I had spent all this effort getting here, turning back without even giving it a try was out of the question. Before I picked up a receiver, Another wave of uneasiness washed over me. I was worried that this phone cord might be severed as well. How was the cord in this phone booth 